They say Students on Ice is a life-changing experience, but it's not until you've been on an expedition yourself that you can fully understand what it means. On our Students on Ice trip to the Arctic, the journey has been as significant as the destination. It has been a journey of shared knowledge and understanding, and one of personal growth and discovery that will take us well beyond the here and now of the expedition. We first flew from Ottawa to Kangakluswak to join our expedition ship. We then sailed north along the west coast of Greenland before crossing Baffin Bay to the Canadian Arctic. Our voyage took us to many new places, giving us the opportunity to meet northern communities, go hiking, observe and learn about wildlife, and gain an understanding of climate change and other challenges facing not only the Arctic and the people who call the north their home, but also the planet as a whole. There are endless ways to describe what this expedition has been for us, but here are some words that capture best the essence of our journey. We have an interpretive walk, Mammals and Birds, with David Gray and Gary Donaldson. And we're going to have field botany with Paul. He's going to gather you guys right here. So follow Paul. Uh, that one's mountain avens. And you see the uh, how it's shaped like a dish? The reason it does that is because the flower actually follows the sun throughout the day. I caught some fairy shrimp in the little pond here. They're n These ones aren't as quick as the ones in the pond back there but they're still pretty hard to catch. Anytime a bird comes and nests there, if they're bringing in nesting material or feeding their young, uh, or the chicks die, the shells, uh, all the poop just increases the possibility of other kinds of life, of plants coming in there and growing. So this is a sediment core. Um, and we're basically going back in time, so we're at three to five centimeters now, and probably back a couple hundred years of Arctic uh, history. And so by now we should be back into, I don't know, the 1800s or the 1700s, well before humans were you know, putting too much CO2 in the atmosphere or polluting the environment. Uh, I always kind of like catching little critters, like frogs or minnows, but I don't get to do it much. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep this in mind to be an oceanographer like Daniele because it's definitely a lot of fun, even if I do get some water in my boots sometimes. Some of the changes are quite alarming. Um, across Greenland we can see evidence of nitrogen pollution from uh, agriculture and from dr driving cars for transportation. Um, we can also see in the algae, um, a lot of the lakes are losing their lake ice and the ponds are losing pond ice earlier in the year. Um, this here is the Jakobshavn Ice Fjord, which drains the Jakobshavn Ice Bray, or a glacier, which comes down off the Greenland ice sheet. There's four main glaciers that drain the Greenland ice sheet. And what we've seen is since about 1850, the ice margin was about over there, and it's been retreating back since 1850 or so. But around 1990, it started speeding up, where it's going tens of kilometers back every year. If the students see it happening now, they know it's really happening, and they know that it's going to continue to happen, and continue to happen at a, at a higher rate 
if nothing's done about, about global warming. And the students can take that information back with them, back home, to make better decisions, uh, that, that more informed decisions to reduce the rate at which global warming is, is taking place. What is beauty? What is the reason you say it's beautiful? Why is it more beautiful than a garbage dump? Now, ask yourself that question. The garbage dump is full of old tin cans, which is a result of industry. It's a result of, of uh, food and good energy brought from someplace else and into a city and then used in a kitchen and thrown away. Is that less beautiful than these rocks, which we don't know anyway. I, uh, I've never seen anything this big before or anything this uh, beautiful and I, I just got overwhelmed with emotion like I usually do when I see something <laughs> breathtaking. Whatever it is, it causes an emotional reaction here. I was speechless. <laughs> Everything just comes back to not having words. <laughs> and this is what beauty is. It's a combination of instinctive and learned reactions that you pull together. And I think we, we say that makes it more satisfaction than, than if it weren't together. I hope that this is here uh, for my children to come and see. And I hope that the planet as a whole, humanity can make positive changes in the way that we live uh, so that we can keep things like this around for as long as possible. Sealing, fishing, whaling. Yeah. My community doesn't do whaling. Okay. No whales come near us. <laughs> but um, yeah, this, yeah, this looks like my home. The hills are still around, just like home. What's that boat over there? That red one. Uh, we get food from that. Oh, you get food? Yeah. So it's like um, um, what is it? At the beginning of the expedition, I was feeling kind of nervous because um, I thought I wouldn't make any friends because I'm shy and I and I thought I wouldn't be able to go up to a person and talk to them. The difference between some of the youth that come on students on ice is that when they first begin the journey, a lot of the northern kids don't have the confidence to be expressive, just like some of the other youth. In fact, they don't, you know, if you ask them to speak, they'll just turn the other way and walk away. Um, because they, they're not confident the, and, they, and they don't really understand or, or realize that they're just as important as, as you are or as, as I am or as anybody else is. <laughs> North, Northern Inuit and other Aboriginal peoples have been through a very rapid change over the last 50 years or so. Um, we were a colonized people and the colonization process basically stripped us of our, our right to be an independent people. Mm -hmm. 
It's fun, the cruise ship is nice. I met a lot of nice people like Tyson. After residential schools, um, you guys were um, hit or um, some speaking your language? Why weren't you allowed to speak your language? It goes back to uh, the, uh, the policies that were uh, in, in, okay, instituted by the federal government through the churches. And we weren't allowed to speak in our school in, or even on uh, the playground. And if we did get caught, we got punished. The colonization and the residential school uh, has had an impact on all the people like no matter how old you are. So those differences actually affect the relationship between the southern youth and the northern youth at the beginning. But I think after a while, after they start talking to each other, then the understanding begins. Oh, so these were the ones, oh, so these are all, um, what are they called? Blackberry. Blackberry. Yeah. Blackberry. And then roll it together. That's the puzzle and then put it in the oil, and that would be the wick. And that would be their stove in their in the houses right there, or in their igloos, or in their tents. Being Inuk and being non-Inuk as well, um, having Métis, I'm in a very privileged position to be able to um, help both sides understand each other. The other thing that we have to remember is that in our culture, in the Inuit culture, silence is a, is a good thing. People find us quiet. I'm not quiet. <laughs> I don't fall into that stereotype. Um, you know, with I think it comes down to uh, the way you know, we interact with each other. It's very normal to have that silence, and and you'll see a lot of the northern kids. They answer with their face. They don't answer verbally like we say yes and no. So when you're sitting with an elder and you're just having a conversation, you don't ask the elder questions. You don't talk to them first. You wait for them to tell you what to do. You wait for them to talk to you, um, just out of respect. And you wait. Uh, patience is another big thing. I have more confidence in myself now. I want, I want to tell everyone back home that it's okay to be different. It's okay to come out of your shell and show everyone who you are. Students on Ice is founded on experience as a, as a learning and teaching device and out of that I think is a much broader uh, sense of what it, what it is to be a human being than you would find in um, more conventional educational contexts or schools. So we're actually building human capacity here. We're turning the experiences into songs, we're turning them into artwork, we're turning them into conversations, we're turning them into lasting friendships. <laughs> because we're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, circling the midnight sun, chasing ice and doing all the things we do, um, all of those different types of activities, those different times of the day and night, provide these opportunities for different people to step forward in different ways. And that uh, is, I don't know, keeps me coming back. It makes me feel very lucky. And in the follow-up, you'll find that most of them, like 90%, will say it, it was life-changing. And I've seen it over a, a decade and a half that I've been associated with the program. And it's true. 
I knew it was going to be a life-changing experience, but to this degree, I had no idea. Being just being here, you you feel almost vulnerable in a way because it's it's so different from your life back home. Um, I went into this thinking that. I would go to the Arctic and um, it would be a great experience and then I'd come back and I'd get on with my life and now I have a completely different view of what I want to do with myself when I get out of it. When you think of the non-Inuit students on the expedition and uh, how much this has opened their eyes to the vastness of this beautiful territory and uh, Greenland um, and the importance of being environmentally aware and, and sensible. then. I, I truly believe they'll go far in life as well. First year, uh, uh, so many of our uh, students hadn't thought about even going to university. Fifteen years later, some have got PhDs in working in environmental science. That's very rewarding. That makes us feel like uh, we had some impact. I built this so I can remember this land. Yeah, so, never know, I might come back again. When I went through this expedition, learning new things and how challenging it is but you get to learn new things and yeah, it makes me see how education could be. It's new ways of learning. And out of that comes uh, a learning environment that has the potential and history has shown that this potential has been realized. It has the potential to change the world. As the expedition comes to an end, we leave with a sense of inner strength. Knowing that we return home with new friendships and knowledge, with these words in mind and a desire to share them with others.